we have signs of very great changes occurring on the planet. Everything happened so fast. There's cricks dried up that have never dried up in my lifetime. We've got a forest here that's already at the edge. We're going into uncharted territory. Our planet is at a crossroads. Global warming isn't out of control, but it soon could be. The warning signs are all around us. This is the challenge of climate change. What can we do about global warming? What will happen to the Earth if we don't? The temperature is rising. Each degree is critical. Just one degree or so of... of one degree climate. warmer than they should. Bump it up. Two, two degrees. To three degrees. The threshold is about three degrees of global warming. Three to four degrees of warming. You're starting to look at four degrees. Three degrees, four degrees, five degrees. Six degrees is almost unimaginable. Imagine the 21st century if global warming accelerates. Where does the next superstorm hit? The next scorching heat wave? The next catastrophe? As the world warms degree by degree, the debate has ended. Scientists around the globe agree we now live in a world warmer by almost one full degree Celsius. Tracking the Earth's vital signs is an armada. Thousands of ships at sea, tens of thousands of stations on land, satellites monitoring from space. Scientists feed the data into the most advanced computer models to calculate what it means for our future. The predictions are alarming. In four decades, glaciers in the Himalayas, the source of water for millions, could be gone. Within 50 years, Greenland's melting ice sheet could be unstoppable. By the end of this century, the Amazon rainforest, home to half the world's biodiversity, could wither to an arid savanna. We're on the brink of one degree warmer, hotter than it's been in thousands of years. A temperature rise between one and six degrees Celsius is possible over the next century. Each degree means a radically different future. In some parts of the world, the first signs of global warming may be arriving with a vengeance. In Australia, bushfires are a natural part of the ecosystem, especially in drought years. But climate change may be pushing conditions from bad to worse. Australia's east coast is a tinderbox. In the winter of 2001, more than 900 fires encircled Sydney. They called it Black Christmas. Now, after a decade of drought, the danger is growing. This year we had fires in Victoria that were very intense. And we fought in them for months and months and months. So it is a bit scary, and the more the bush dries out, we're getting fires happen in areas we've never had them before. Current data show the average global temperature has already risen 0.8 degrees Celsius. Victoria, Australia's second most populous state, is in the grip of one of the worst bushfire seasons in recorded history. For many, these fires are a warning a wake-up call about what climate change can do. Less than a degree of warming is what we've so far experienced, and that is enough to transform Australia, which was already the driest continent on Earth, 
into a landmass which has lost so much of its water that they're currently experiencing the worst drought for a thousand years. That drought has driven the fires out of the bush and into the front yards of thousands of Australians. because Rob really wants to stay. In some Sydney neighborhoods, it's an awful choice. Stay and fight the fire or leave and hope your home will be there when you return. Yes, Mum, look, I'm gonna have to call you back. It's a bit of a fluster. Okay, see you, Mum. A house is a house, you know, if we lost it, we lost it, but yeah, if you lose a loved one, it was our first house and we just bought it, so he was gonna do everything he could to, to save it. My wife left with uh, the most important things and it was up to me to make sure that it was going to all be there when she came back. Okay, Rob. No worries, honey. No worries. I'll call you from your mum. Okay, you take it easy. No worries. You okay. get out of here. I'll see okay. you later. See ya. Bushfires are already bad. Climate scientists predict in the next three decades, they'll get worse. And it doesn't end there. Global warming doesn't just mean the slow increase in average temperatures. It completely changes the way the Earth system operates, which is why we can see droughts in one place, floods in another, or even a succession of drought and flood in the same exact location. National Geographic author Mark Linus spent years compiling data from climate models understand how each degree of warming could threaten the planet. It's very difficult for people to visualize the future impacts of global warming. And it's something that I really wanted to try and do to help people visualize the reality because it isn't actually intuitive that the emissions from your car exhaust are going to be melting a glacier in the Himalayas in 50 years time. While experts estimate the average temperature could rise up to six degrees Celsius, or nearly 11 degrees Fahrenheit over the next 100 years, the future isn't set in stone. Even a small shift in the Earth's temperature, just six degrees, can have extreme consequences. A six degree shift from one day to the next is the sort of thing that we expect with normal weather fluctuations. If it's six degrees hotter tomorrow, I might just be wearing some shorts. Six degrees in terms of a global average change, six degrees colder is the difference between now and the last ice age, 18,000 years ago, when the ice sheets themselves advanced to just the edge of Oxford, and in places, the ice cap was more than a mile thick. Just six degrees of cooling transformed the Earth into an ice age. Imagine it's six degrees hotter, the very earliest changes would start high above the Earth. The atmosphere is our buffer zone between the planet's surface and outer space. A small percentage are the greenhouse gases, a cocktail of water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone. They are like a dome over the planet retaining just enough of the sun's reflected energy to maintain temperatures that support life. As the amounts of those gases increase, they trap more heat and can radically affect the climate all over the planet. For the last 250 years, greenhouse emissions have soared as we find more and more ways to use more and more energy. CO2 is the hidden price we pay. Carbon dioxide rises into the atmosphere from the energy that powers all our modern conveniences. It's literally in the air we breathe. There are now 383 carbon dioxide molecules out of every million. It seems minuscule, but as the amount of CO2 rises, so does the average temperature all over the planet. 
doubling of CO2 is a guarantee for a global disaster. The dangerous level is about 450 parts per million, and we're already up to 383. Additional global warming of one or two degrees Celsius is a very big deal. All we're doing is saying what we think our best estimate is what will happen if we carry on the route we're going. So all you can do is to lay out a number of possible pictures of the future and hope people will select the right one. How will we respond? What will the planet look like if it's warmer by one degree, two degrees, three degrees or more? Are we willing to take that risk? If the world warms by one degree, the Arctic is ice-free for half the year, opening the legendary Northwest Passage for ships. Tens of thousands of homes around the Bay of Bengal are flooding. Hurricanes begin hitting the South Atlantic. Severe droughts in the Western US cause shortages in global grain and meat markets. This could be our world plus one degree. At one degree additional warming to today, we're likely to see the emergence of new deserts in the western half of the United States, from Texas in the south right up to the Canadian border, is in danger of becoming new hyper-arid areas where really no crops can be grown at all. In western Nebraska, ranchers depend on spring rains that aren't very dependable these days. Cattleman Bruce Wohler needs 15,000 liters of water every day for his herd to survive. We've been hauling water here for about 20, 25 days, and sometimes twice a day. Looks like another dry tank. After seven years of drought, reservoirs are at their lowest in a century. Just keeping his herd alive is a daily struggle. If the animals go without water, they die just like anybody else. When I was growing up, it was a lot greener. The more water, there's creeks dried up that have never dried up in my lifetime. And I know even in my dad's lifetime, there's creeks that he said he never seen dry up. And they're dried up now. Ranchers like the Wollers live in sync with the weather and rely on its patterns. Knowledge that's been passed down through their families over six generations. And that gave us a little bit of a benefit when we wanted to start up our own operation as young married people ourselves. But past generations of experience that helped them thrive here may not be enough in a warming world. I think it's just a trend that we're going through. I hope it is anyway. It'd be very difficult to keep ranching because a lot of this country is ungrazable, unusable for cattle if we don't have water. And if it turned into a desert type of climate, just wouldn't be cattle here. Warming of just one degree could turn some of America's most fertile ranch land into desert again. 6,000 years ago, much of the American West was part of a vast desert dominating the continent. A minor shift in the Earth's orbit caused the summer sun to warm slightly, just enough to radically transform this entire region. Only a very thin layer of topsoil covers the desert sand that still lurks just centimeters below the surface. All it took was one or two degrees warmer and the moisture disappeared. The 1930s gave us a glimpse of just how fragile the land can be. So think of a repeat of the Dust Bowl situation and multiply it by about 20. This could devastate a huge part of the Western United States. But a shift of only about one degree could transform cattle country into a wasteland of searing heat and relentless drought.
For now, the sands under this shallow soil are stable. But for how long? As we race toward a planet warmer by one degree, the global warming scorecard lists both losers and winners. While the western U.S. is dry and thirsty, England is enjoying an agricultural makeover. Fortunes will be made and lost if global weather patterns rearrange where different crops can be grown. The winters, which used to be very hard in this country, are getting much, much milder. And so in some senses, that's a good thing. That's, of course, not counterbalanced by the devastation which is affecting other parts of the world. Right now, England is in the right place at the right time for one of the world's most fragile and most valuable crops. You, you can have it too hot for grapes, of course. You've realized in the Champagne region now it's becoming too hot. When David Middleton first planted Champagne-style grapes, neighbors thought he'd gone mad. But as wine-producing regions in France are getting hotter, the climate for growing grapes is migrating across the English Channel. The idea of a fine English wine is no longer a joke. Now, there are more than 400 vineyards in Britain. Middleton is planting another crop that's astonishing for England, again made possible by climate change, olive trees from Tuscany. The olives will love it here. Our temperature in the summer will be out of the Mediterranean shortly, so therefore they will enjoy it and we will enjoy the olives later as well. None of this would have been possible only a short time ago. The Earth's average temperature has always fluctuated, and a variable climate isn't unusual. It's the pace of climate change today that's unprecedented. If you had asked us 10 or 20 years ago, what would be the impact of one or two degrees additional warming? We would say, well, probably we can live with that. NASA climate scientist James Hansen was one of the first to sound the alarm about global warming. The threat has only escalated as he struggled to be heard. What we realize now is that we're getting so close to tipping points that we're going to have to stabilize atmospheric CO2. Studying climates in the past has given Hansen a window onto the dangers posed by global warming. In the last million years, it's never been more than one degree Celsius warmer than it is now. What we are doing now with the human-made greenhouse gases is an order of magnitude larger, and it's being introduced very rapidly. The planet has experienced climate change before, but it usually plays out over thousands or millions of years. Now global warming is measured in decades, even years. It means scores of species won't be able to keep up. Warming at this speed could send us into uncharted territory, like nothing we've experienced in the history of life on Earth. Global warming started with our insatiable appetite for energy. Every switch we flip, every plug, every button we push to turn something on inevitably leads back to a place like this. Nearly 90% of the world's energy starts as a fossil fuel. Coal, oil, natural gas. But the chemistry of burning fossilized remains of prehistoric plants and animals is inescapable. Carbon dioxide. These three fuels combined are the single largest source of CO2 emissions pouring into the atmosphere. They've enhanced the quality of life for generations. It's hard to imagine getting along without them. 
product by product, it may not seem like a lot to make one pair of sunglasses or light one sign. But the carbon impact of everything we do adds up. I got to wondering, what's the carbon impact of something like a cheeseburger? Americans, all 300 million of us, eat an average of three cheeseburgers every week. And so that's like 150 cheeseburgers for each one of us every year. That's billions of cheeseburgers in the United States alone every year. Among the scientists and other experts investigating climate change, Jamey Cassio has staked out a unique territory. I had to be able to calculate the numbers, calculate the actual solid numerical quantitative footprint of a cheeseburger. The carbon footprint means all the energy that was consumed every step of the way for each of a cheeseburger's component parts. When you look at the feedstock that goes to feed the cattle, growing the lettuce, growing the wheat that gets transformed into the bun, and milking the cattle, processing the milk into cheese, processing the cattle into beef, trucking all that stuff around, keeping it cold. It turns out each burger has a pretty significant carbon footprint of its own. And carbon dioxide isn't the only greenhouse gas that's produced in the end. But then it struck me, there's another critical part of the overall greenhouse gas footprint that I wasn't including. Methane, methane from cattle. Well, the FDA calls it very politely enteric fermentation. It's what comes out of the cow. And methane, as it turns out, is the equivalent of at least 23 units of carbon dioxide. Add it all up, all those cheeseburgers and all that CO2, and you've got a very big number. Pretty close to 200 million metric tons. 200 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent just from cheeseburgers in the United States. Casio has calculated that there are even more greenhouse gas emissions every year from cheeseburgers than from all the SUVs in the United States. And this is just one kind of food. Think about all of the enormous variety of things that we purchase, we buy, we consume. And you realize that it's these everyday activities that are really the critical aspect of human activity leading to global warming. Even at the lower end of the climate forecast, there could be fundamental changes in the way the planet functions. If the temperature rises beyond plus one degree, it could threaten nature's delicate balance. From the bottom of the oceans to the world's highest peaks, If the world warms by two degrees, some changes to the biosphere are no longer gradual. Greenland's glaciers are disappearing. So much ice has melted, polar bears struggle to survive. Insects migrate in strange new directions. As a temperate climate moves north in the US, pine beetles kill off the white bark forests. A grizzly bear's key source of food in the fall. New forests take root in Canada's melting tundra. The Pacific islands of Tuvalu are lost beneath the rising tides of global warming. This could be our world plus two degrees. At two degrees of warming, the impacts in the marine ecosystem are going to be much more severe. We're likely to lose the vast majority of the world's tropical coral reefs. It's a problem that's keeping Ove Herr Goldberg up late into the night. To some, it might seem almost incredible that we could change something as fast as the ocean. I mean, the Pacific Ocean, I mean, if you just take that huge bowl of water, how could we change it? 
a marine biologist at the University of Queensland in Australia, Ove is tracking changes in coral reefs. They're acting a little bit like a canary in the coal mine. Miners used to take a little bird down with them, and when the bird got sick, they knew to withdraw because there was gas building up in the mine. Well, coral reefs are, you know, a beautiful, biodiverse uh, part of the earth, and the very fact that that's disappearing should have all of us worried, just like the canary in the coal mine. Located on the Great Barrier Reef, along the northeast coast of Australia, his lab is on the front lines in the war against climate change. Recently, the Great Barrier Reef suffered two massive bleaching events. When waters warmed past the coral's tolerance of 30 degrees Celsius, they began expelling the algae they need to survive. Large sections of the reef died. When you jump off the side of a boat and you see a bleaching event, it really comes home to you, the scale of the changes that are going on. What would happen if we woke up one morning and one in every five trees in our favourite forest had just disappeared? Well, that's what's been happening in coral reefs. More than a million different species live, feed and breed around reefs. They need the reef. They literally can't live without it. Oceans are the planet's largest carbon sink, nature's primary mechanism for absorbing CO2 out of the atmosphere. But lately, there are indications these systems are breaking down. Under normal conditions, tiny sea creatures like forums and coccolithophores absorb carbon out of the water and use it to build their shells and skeletons. But there is a tipping point when too much CO2 in the oceans turns the water increasingly acidic. Acidification dissolves the creature's shells and skeletons and prevents them from absorbing more CO2 out of the water to build new ones. Some of these tiny animals at the bottom of the food chain measure only one millimeter. But the fate of all sea creatures, of all shapes and sizes, larger and larger, hangs in the balance. Alter the ocean.